Hey guys, uh, I'm back and let's go ahead and discuss the second red scare. So last time we discussed uh, Truman's presidency, which led us from World War II and the post-war boom all the way up to the beginning of the 50s and uh, into the starts of the Cold War. So we talked about China, we talked about Korea, we talked about the policy of containment. So let's go ahead and talk about the Cold War's effect on society and here at home. And how we measure that effect is through the second Red Scare. So I'm going to make a lot of comparisons today to the first Red Scare that happened in the 20s. And um, yeah, AP likes to compare and contrast the two. So there we go. We're, we're going to, you know, review some history and cover some new history as well. So let's go ahead and dive into the second Red Scare. So here's our timeline that we're dealing with. We're going to at first deal with the uh, Rosenberg um, trials and uh, what happened with them. So they're charged with spying and giving atomic secrets. They're convicted and executed in 53. We will dive deeper into this event in the coming slides. We also have uh, Joseph McCarthy, Senator Joseph McCarthy, who basically says, yeah, I got a list of known communists working for the State Department. <laughs> Everybody believes him and doesn't fact check. So from the time period in 1950, 1954, he's basically doing this communist witch hunt, um, accusing high-level government officials of being communists. And during these anti-communist hearings, um, yeah, people are seeing the witch hunt play out on TV. And... Um, People in his own party are like, whoa, okay, that, that's a bit much. So in 1954, the reporter Edward Morrow um, did, did a television expose on McCarthy, kind of brings to light all this stuff. Um, Army lawyer Joseph Welch is going to rebuke this as well. Um, McCarthy is going to be eventually censured by the Senate and... Um, yeah, once that happens, anti-communism fades away. So, dude, we got a lot for a second Red Scare. And uh, it kind of explains the conformity of the 50s. So let's go ahead and jump into each one of these and see what in the hell happened. Because there's more stuff. So our second Red Scare officially happens in 1947 to 1954. And... Um, you know, yeah, starting with Truman, because, I mean, come on, we were frenemies with Stalin and, like, the Soviets during World War II because Hitler and Mussolini in well, Japan, right? So, but, you know, when we exploded the atomic bomb and the Ulta Conference happened before that, and we're, like, um, saying, yeah, we got an atomic bomb, and Soviet Union's like, uh, <laughs> thanks for letting us know, and then we're like, you know, hey, let's divide up Germany. Oh, let's combine all our parts. So he's like, no. <laughs> Distrust everywhere, right? Because of the Alta Conference and the Potsdam Conference. But anyways, after the war, um, it starts to like kick in high gear. So we got 1947 to 1954. Um, Truman's Attorney General, Howard McGrath, is basically going to set the tone with this. There are today many communists in America. They are everywhere, in factories, offices, butcher shops, on street corners, in private businesses, and each carries in himself the germs of death for society. <laughs> that doesn't sound like paranoid. I don't know what does. But anyways, um, yeah, we don't really know how many communists there are in America at that point in time. We just know who votes for the Communist Party. Um, and in 1932, there is about 100,000, so... It may have grown, it may have shrunk, we just don't know. We're thinking it grew. But anyways, uh, the second Red Scare, you know, is kind of like the first Red Scare. It follows our victory in World Wars, right? So the, second, the first Red Scare happened after our victory in World War I. Second Red Scare, after our victory in World War II. So Truman um, administration kind of sees the communist conspiracy behind the civil wars in Europe and Asia... And, he, you know, they think that there's communist conspirators and spies that have already infiltrated American society. 
whether it be in the State Department, the military, and whatnot. So Truman is going to start to set up a loyalty review board in 1947, which kind of kickstarts the second Red Scare. They investigate the backgrounds of federal employees and cause about thousands of them to lose their jobs. So, for the most part, um, this is pretty much, you know, yeah, people just starting to be paranoid and starting to accuse others of um, really... um, yeah, <laughs> we, we think there's communists everywhere, all right? So, um, we also, like, have American Communist Party people jailed for advocating the overthrow of the U.S. government. I mean, we, we're good. We're pulling out all the stops. And in the case of Dennis et al. versus the United States, Supreme Court is going to uphold the constitutionality of the Smith Act that was passed in 1940, which made it illegal to advocate or teach the overthrow of the government by force, or to belong to an organization with this objective. So that Smith Act right there is going to open the doors to even, like, accusing teachers and, like, people like that of being, like, communists and, you know, making it illegal. So, ah, the 50s. All right. Over Truman's veto, there's another act passed, which is the McCarran Internal Security Act. So, it's going to make it unlawful to advocate or support the establishment of the totalitarian um, government. It's going to restrict the employment and travel of those joining communist front organizations. And um, also authorize the creation of detention camps for subversives. Dude, (laughs) this is... uh, a bit much, but really, this is our attitude of the time. I mean, once we set up the Committee on Un-American Activities, they're going to be, like, steamrolling the head. I mean, look at the political cartoon on the left. It's okay, we're hunting communists, yet they're, like, running over people in society. And then, ugh, dude, the one on the right, it's like, you read books, eh? They're basically interrogating the poor, um, the poor teacher here who's just trying to teach them history and social studies and, you know, oh, they got the USSR on the map. We best, like, (laughs) cut that out. Uh Uh-oh, picture of Jefferson. Yeah, just just saying. Man, I so would have probably been put on (laughs) on the blacklist. Even talking trash about the second Red Scare, I probably would have been put on the blacklist. So, mm. 50s, conformity. All right, check this one out. Say, whatever happened to freedom from fear? You have the House and American Activities Committee members um, trying to do a smear campaign, it looks like. And that looks like Nixon leading the charge there. And yeah, people are just like running away and like afraid to exercise their civil rights and civil liberties. So this really is a time of conformity and um, really just people in fear. So there are some people who do stand up against the House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, These guys were originally set up to seek out Nazis in 39, but they're, of course, they're going to shift to communists, right, Um, during the Second Red Scare. And um, they look at not only government officials, but now they're starting to look at Hollywood, actors, actresses, directors, writers, the whole deal. And they're called up to testify in front of Congress, but the ones who refuse to testify by pleading the fifth are tried for contempt of Congress. They're blacklisted from Hollywood, and they're going to be known as the Hollywood Ten. There's a good movie that kind of covers this. It's named Trumbo, which is um, about Dalton Trumbo, who is like an Academy Award winning like writer and stuff, who is one of these Hollywood Ten 
I think he's actually a dude right here in glasses. I think that's Tremble right there. But um, yeah, he's he's one of the accused. And basically, if you're blacklisted, it's like no one wants to hire you because if they do, then they themselves may be under suspicion. So you've got people on both sides of the Hollywood tent. You got people in support of them, like big time actors and actresses like Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart right here on the right hand side. And then you've got people like John Wayne on the opposite end who want to like testify against the communists. So, or suspected communists actually. Some of them were not communists. <laughs> they were just socialist leaning or something. I don't know. But anyways, this kind of shows like the reach and the extent to which people are like being scrutinized and really, you know, civil liberties are basically non-existent during this time. You gotta conform. Or else you're suspected of being communist and your life is over. So with the espionage cases that we have, there there were spies amongst our ranks. There really were. I mean... But the government kind of just, you know, is acting on paranoia and goes too far sometimes from violating civil liberties and such. So we've got a couple of cases to look at. We've got the Alger Hiss case, which, um, you know, Whitaker Chambers, who's a confessed communist, in his testimony, he brings up Alger Hiss's name and um, it leads to a trial. Alger Hiss works for the State Department. Hiss denies the accusation, saying he was a communist, um, and had given secret documents to Chambers. He denies all that. But he's still convicted of perjury and sent to prison. So because of the Hiss trial, people are fearing, oh no, people in the highest levels of government are communist spies. And then we've got the case of the Rosenbergs. Now, the Rosenbergs may have been spies. <laughs> okay. Ethel Rosenberg, well, Julius Rosenberg may have been a spy. Ethel, guilty by association. So, their husband and wife. And um, when the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb in 1949, a lot of Americans are like, uh, how did they get the secret? <laughs> so, um, we've got Carl Fuchs, um, who's a British scientist who worked with, on the Manhattan Project. He admitted giving the atom bomb secrets to the Russians. But uncovering this, the FBI traces another spy ring to Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. So, after the trial that happened in 51, the Rosenbergs are found guilty of treason and executed. And again, there's very little evidence against them. Kind of reminding us of the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti, during the 20s, where there was very little evidence against them also, and they were still executed. So yeah, the Rosenbergs are executed in 1953. So civil rights groups are going to um, say that the anti-communist hysteria is responsible for the conviction and punishment of the Rosenbergs. And I mean, really, you know, just like this caption says right here, victims of a Cold War sock on Vanzetti dude. <laughs> We're seeing history literally repeat itself pretty much from the first Red Scare to the second Red Scare. So as far as the cultural impact goes, um, really it diminishes a lot of our freedom of expression. We're afraid to be totally out there with expressing ourselves. I mean, it goes to the point to where people are not wanting to wear red. Come on now. It, it's, it's just extensive but we do get some good film noir style stuff um playwrights like arthur miller who is accused of being a communist came under attack for being anti-american and he writes the crucible at this time which pretty much you know is talking about salem but he's basically using it also to refer to present day times with the communist witch hunts so we've got his uh, play, Death of a Salesman, that's also under attack for being anti-American. Roger and Hammerstein, South Pacific, was criticized um, because it attacks racial segregation. <laughs> so they're calling them communists. Loyalty oaths are commonly required of writers and teachers as a condition of employment. So yeah, your teachers would have to do loyalty oaths in order to be hired as a teacher. 
and to keep their teaching contract. So the ACLU at this time is going to really try to fight against this, and they argue that the First Amendment protects freedom of expression from, you know, that includes unpopular political views and membership in political groups, including the Communist Party, but really the damage is already done because, I mean, now with Joseph McCarthy rising up the ranks and saying, yeah, I've got a list of suspected communists working for the State Department, people are already so paranoid by this point. And they're like, oh my God, this must be true. All he could have been doing is just waving pieces of paper in front of people and taking advantage of the public's fears to push his own agenda. He goes ahead and attacks various people in government. So yeah, he rides this wave of anti-communist feelings and makes himself into one of the most powerful men in America because of people's fears. So he knows that people won't attack him because they're afraid to stand out and be accused themselves. Now, he uses like a steady stream of unsupported accusations about communists and government just to keep the media on him and to discredit the Truman administration. Because remember, this is happening at the tail end of the Truman administration. So working class Americans are like, yeah, this guy's tough on communism. But they dislike his ruthless tactics because they think he's going a bit too far. So he is popular, but... um, You know, people are kind of still fearful of him. Even Eisenhower wouldn't dare defend his old friend George Marshall against McCarthy's untruths. So finally, in 1954, McCarthy is exposed on television. The Senate committee televised the hearings, and McCarthy was seen as a bully by millions of viewers. So the Republicans are finally going to join up with the Democrats and trying to censure McCarthy. So after that happens, the communist witch hunt that he was bringing about, McCarthyism, had played itself out. And three years later, McCarthy dies as a broken man. So I mean, but his mark is felt and he does ruin a lot of lives because of this. So now that we got the second Red Scare out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about some Eisenhower. So here are the Eisenhower years, and we're going to be talking about domestic policy first, and then we're going to be talking about foreign policy with how Eisenhower handles the Cold War. So domestic policy first. Now, you know, he's basically our president of the 60s. It's 1952 to 1960. So yeah, when we associate the 50s, we associate them with Eisenhower. And Eisenhower is a war hero. I mean... We remember him from World War II. So when he runs for president, he had, he's the first guy to actually utilize the television as a means of, you know, advertisement and such. So his campaign uh, slogan, I like Ike, and the commercial that coincides with it is really going to capture the attention of the American public. It's catchy. You guys can check it out on YouTube. It really is a catchy tune. And people trust him. They trust he'll be tough on communism because, I mean, he fought against Nazis and stuff in World War II. So, yeah, they really like Eisenhower. The 50s themselves, I mean, when we think of the 50s, we think of stereotypical, like, you know, stuff that looks like Greece, pretty much, and happy days. We think of rock and roll. We think of, like, poodle skirts and, like, you know, Cadillacs and, like, whatnot. So, um we have as a nostalgic view of the 50s, but really the 50s wasn't exactly like that. I mean, yeah, on the surface, it looks like that. But when we consider African Americans, the poor, everybody else, it's not exactly a 50s. Not the complete picture of the 50s. So what we're really seeing is middle class suburbia play out in the 50s in stuff like I Love Lucy and you know, movies about the 50s, we're not really seeing the plight of, like, African Americans or minorities or the poor. So, because if we did, we would see segregation. But, yeah, the 50s, they are what they are. So, here's the first election of the 50s. 
we got Adele Stevenson versus Eisenhower. Eisenhower again, war hero, super popular, runs as a Republican. And people like his policies. I mean, Korea first, communism, and then corruption. So, huh, his vice president is going to be Richard Nixon. Uh, <laughs> Nixon's got, got some issues. <laughs> they come out, of course, during his presidency, but... Uh, okay, he is named vice president because of his anti-communist stance. He's part of that House on American Activities Committee. Eisenhower really doesn't like Nixon, but because the party kind of wants him to run with Eisenhower, he goes with it. Nixon is your consummate politician. He is smooth. He is slick. He's kind of slimy, too. <laughs> so, um... What happens is, um, six weeks before the election, there is an illegal secret political fund that was discovered and publicized, and, um, Nixon's friends are going to be like, hey, withdraw from the ticket, because it's associated with him. <laughs> Nixon goes on TV, and he's, like, uh, talking about receiving bri- like, not bribes or money, but what he got out of that was a little dog named Checkers. Yeah, the guy uses the guilt trip about, oh no, we can't take away the dog from the kids. Checkers. <laughs> he goes on TV and he talks about this and the American public actually believes it. So, <laughs> yeah, this Checkers speech saves him and Eisenhower decides to keep him on the ticket. You guys can check out the Checker speech also on YouTube. It's up there. But despite this, Eisenhower and Nixon win the election by a landslide. There you go. Adelaide Stevenson doesn't stand a chance. So here's Mamie Eisenhower, our first lady, and that is Dwight D. Eisenhower and Mamie when they're younger, probably in the 20s or before. So, Eisenhower, um, he pledges to go to war, go to Korea and end the war, because remember, this started under Truman, hadn't been ended yet, because, well, Stalin ends, there hasn't been the armistice signed yet, so when he gets elected, armistice signed, signed you know, in June of 1953, so after a couple months of fighting, and Korea is divided at the 38th parallel, just like it is now. North Korea, South Korea. So there he is, already making good on one of his promises. Korea first. Done. So as far as like other um, stuff that happens under Eisenhower's presidency, here's some more uh, domestic policy. He establishes the Highway Act of 1956. And this really is going to transform the country. So, he, this is what he has to say. Together, the united forces of our communication and transportation systems are dynamic elements in the very name we bear, the United States. Without them, we would be a mere alliance of many separate parts. So, what we're doing with the highway system, or the Highway Act, is when we went over to Germany for World War II, we saw the Autobahn, and we're like, oh my god, this is great. The Autobahn is their highway system. And how it was laid out well enough to transport weapons across the country. So that's kind of what we want to do to the United States. We want to develop our interstate highway system to transport weapons around the country. <laughs> yeah, we, we got it in mind to transport like nuclear missiles and stuff. But we're trying to kill two birds with one stone and really get transportation going. And also pave the way for us to move around troops and supplies and such if we need to. So, and especially weapons. The Highway Act, um, the federal government's going to commit $32 billion at the time to build 41,000 miles of highway. And all these new highways are going to encourage the spread of the suburbs and travel. So we're going to see a lot of new industries spring up, like motels. 
like the Holiday Inn and stuff, service stations, well, basically gas stations and other service stations, you know, rest areas. We're going to see like all that stuff pop up. So yeah, new industries, fast food. I mean, that's another thing that pops up at this time. Yeah, McDonald's. So really now we're going to have the justification for new taxes on fuels, tires, vehicles, just to improve, you know, to improve national defense. I mean, yeah, we get that tax revenue from all that stuff. But at the same time, of course, the public works projects that we're developing around the high, creation of the highway system is going to create more jobs. The trucking industry is going to take off. You know, the growth of suburbs is going to take off as well because now we've got a solid means to travel into the city. And um, so cars, trucks, highways, even though this is good for the American public, it's going to hurt the railroad industry and the environment as well because, um, you know, we got more people traveling, so more pollution and such. And public transportation, um, instead of people using this as much, now the old and the poor are going to depend mostly on it. So, yeah, here's our highway system. This is an old map, but, I mean, with the interstate highway system, I mean, look at, let's see, I-10, for instance. You can go from L.A. to Florida with I-10. <laughs> um, I-35, you can go all the way up to Minnesota. I-90, you can go from, like, Boston to Seattle. So... Yeah, connecting the whole country together. It's a transportation revolution. Kind of like what canals and turnpikes did back in the day. And of course the rail lines connecting the country together. Yeah, another transportation revolution. So this definitely has a positive effect on not only the economy, but transportation and the American people. So Eisenhower runs again <laughs> against Adelaide Stevenson again. It's a rematch, and, well, Eisenhower wins again. And it's in part because of how he handles the Cold War and obviously how he handles, you know, domestic policy. There's a couple of things we left off of Eisenhower's domestic policy that we're going to come back and cover when we cover the civil rights movement, so just keep that in mind. There are more things Eisenhower does, but let's go ahead and do some foreign policy first. And then we will swing back around to civil rights, probably next lecture. So Eisenhower with the Cold War. Let's go ahead and do this. Now, okay, Truman's got containment. Eisenhower is going to have brinkmanship. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're we're rising up with this seriously. But all right, let's let's deal. So, okay, remember we've got NATO, which is North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's basically Western Europe and us with Canada saying, yeah, we, we pledge to protect each other, right? The communists have something similar with the Warsaw Pact, which is basically going to include all these countries here with, you know, the flag right there. The Eastern European satellite nations, I mean, and yeah, this going to include all them. So you can see the Iron Curtain being drawn um, and pretty much it's going to be um, yeah, it's East Europe versus Western Europe. So, as far as foreign policy goes, we're going to have a lot going on under Eisenhower. Um, we have the development of the hydrogen bomb, because remember, once the Soviets developed their atomic bomb, we're like, oh no, <laughs> we had to do something bigger, so we developed the H-bomb. With the Korean War, and now John Foster Dulles, <laughs> um, who is in charge now of I think the, is he in charge of the State Department or is he in charge of the Defense Department? He's in charge of one of them. <laughs> um, 
He's going to come up with massive retaliation, which... Let, let's just let the slide <laughs> discuss this. It's kind of crazy. All right, we also got the beginnings of the Vietnam War, starting up with French Indochina. Um, that war ends at Dien Bien Phu with a communist victory. The Geneva Agreement talk about the division of Vietnam, and we don't want another country falling towards communism in Asia, so... Um, yeah, the U.S. becomes involved. The Warsaw Pact is officially formed, which is basically Soviet Union's answer to NATO. Um, we also have revolts happening in Poland and Hungary. So how we handle those is going to be kind of different than how we handled Greece and Turkey when they were coming under threat of, you know, communist rule. We also have the conflict about the Suez Canal. Sputnik, which is going to scare the hell out of everybody, thinking that the Soviets are going to shoot us from space. And Fidel Castro comes in charge of Cuba, and now the communists are at our back door. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this with brinkmanship first. Here's John Foster Dulles. He's a critic of Truman's containment, saying, yeah, um, it's not going far enough to just contain communism. What we should do is liberate communism. So what he's going to practice is brinkmanship. Basically, he wants everybody on red alert <laughs> to the point of war without going to war. So it's like our finger is like on top of the button, pretty much. The ability to get to the verge without getting into a war is a necessary art. This is how he views this. So we're like on constant like red alert and constant edge that stuff's gonna happen <laughs> he of course is going to be attacked for intensifying the cold war damaging relations with neutral and communist nations and rightfully so i mean come on now brinkmanship really so conservatives are like yeah tough on communism everybody else is like no <laughs> world war three might happen so if the U.S. pushed the communists to the brink of war, a lot of people were afraid that we would enter war. But then his supporters are like, no, nah, they're going to back down because of our nuclear support superiority. But dude, we don't want to like launch these things. <laughs> oh, I just can't with brinkmanship. But in the end, though, Eisenhower prevented Dulles from <laughs> carrying out all of these extreme ideas. He kind of kept the leash on him but still oof, brinkmanship really with the hydrogen bomb at our disposal uh, not a good idea so here's an h-bomb um it's a hundred times more powerful than the atomic bomb in japan that was dropped at hiroshima and nagasaki in 1945 so our first successful explosion of it was in november 1952 but the Soviets explode one of their own the following year. Again, fueling this paranoia that we've got spies amongst our ranks giving the Soviets atomic secrets. So, huh. let's go ahead and talk about some massive retaliation. Dulles, <laughs> again, is going to advocate for placing greater reliance on nuclear weapons and air power and spending less on conventional stuff like army and navy. So basically enough drop bombs. He thought, yeah, it's gonna save some money, more bang for our buck, quite literally because of the atomic weaponry. Help balance the federal budget, increase pressure on potential enemies. But some people are gonna be like, whoa, dude, massive retaliation? <laughs> it looks more like a policy for mutual extinction and the end of the world. Because if they hit us, we're going to hit them back with something way more powerful. So nuclear weapons, um, he felt, were a powerful deterrent against the superpowers, fighting an all-out war because we knew the death and destruction that would come from them. But, of course, he acknowledged that. I mean, yeah, there's still going to be small, like, brushfire wars, like what's been brewing out in Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. But Eisenhower refuses to see even small, to use even small nuclear weapons in these conflicts. Thank God, or else, dude, 
to, we may not be here, <laughs> had he followed massive retaliation and brinkmanship. It's one of these instances where it's like the right guy was in charge. Adelaide Stevenson probably would have been just as temperamental as Eisenhower, but <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's kind of, kind of crazy. So, yeah. Now, um, I'm going to show you guys duck and cover in class. You guys should... <laughs> Pay attention to this is probably be one of the most hilarious things that we watch, but it's gotten to the point in the 50s where we're having atomic bomb drills at schools, kind of like how we have active shooter drills now in schools. We actually had this in schools where they taught you to duck and cover under a desk just to defend yourself in case of a nuclear attack. So, <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> This is some great times we're living in the 50s. Conformity and constant fear of losing your life to an all-out nuclear war. 50s were awesome. <laughs> Add segregation to the mix. Yeah, it's not exactly as cool as we thought we, <laughs> we thought it was. Again, on the surface, looks awesome. Looks like Greece and happy days underneath. And second Red Scare, Cold War, and segregation. Mm-mm. <laughs> No thanks. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, Vietnam because yeah, we start to get involved this time. So, <laughs> um, during World War II, the Japanese invaded and ruled Vietnam through a public government. And we back up the communist leader um, at the time, Ho Chi Minh, because he formed a resistance group called the Vietnam Minh and um, they fought against the Japanese and the Vichy French, which, remember, they were the puppet government set up by Hitler when he took over France. So, yeah, they're fighting against us. So we're going to hook up Ho Chi Minh in World War II um, to fight against those two forces. And they helped train the Viet Minh. We, we send people um, that will later become the CIA to help train the Viet Minh and help Ho Chi Minh. Um, we told him we'd support his goal for Vietnamese after independence after the war, but then Cold War, <laughs> we're like, nope, we're not backing communists anymore. So Ho Chi Minh is going to be like, yeah, after the war, the U.S. is going to keep their promise and support our independence. But yeah, Cold War happens. We, we take backsies. So... Um, after World War II, Ho Chi Minh really did feel that the U.S. would not allow France to reoccupy its former colony. Thought, yeah, it's done. But <laughs> no, French soldiers did return to reassert their authority, reclaim the colony, and after a nine-year war, it ended up in French defeat. And Vietnam was now divided in two halves, North Vietnam being communist, South Vietnam being democratic and more under U.S. influence. So by 1950... Um, this anti-colonial war in Indochina became part of the Cold War rivalry between communists and anti-communists. Again, one of these, like, smaller, like, brushfire wars, right? So, Truman's government is going to start giving military aid to the French, because they're our allies, and China and the Soviets give aid to the Viet Minh because, well, they're communists, and to Ho Chi Minh himself. Now, in 1954, um... The French army was trapped at Dien Bien Phu, and they surrender. So after the French had tried to convince Eisenhower to send troops, he refused. But we don't want another country falling towards communism. So after the Geneva Accords are signed in 54, Vietnam is divided at the 17th parallel, you know, for two years until elections could be held to unify the country. But... In North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh's going to establish a communist dictatorship. South Vietnam, uh, Diem is going to emerge as an anti-communist leader. And again, during the Cold War, we're like, hey, you're an anti-communist? Cool, we'll back you. 
even if they're a terrible person. We do that. And damn, terrible person for the people of Vietnam. But we still back him because he's anti-communist. So we've got the general election to unite Vietnam. It was never held because South Vietnam's government feared that the communists would win because Ho Chi Minh is way more popular (laughs) than Diem. So from 1955 to 1961, the U.S. is going to give about a billion in aid to South Vietnam so that they could, you know, keep up with stuff and defend themselves. And Eisenhower is justifying this because of the domino theory. So just like when you stack up dominoes and you hit one and the rest fall, he feels that, you know, Asia is kind of like that. If one falls to communism, the rest will fall. And China's already fallen to communism, so we've got to prevent the rest, which is South Vietnam, from falling to communism. So we're going to do everything in our power to, like, prevent this. Even developing an, another alliance. So, like we have NATO, the North American, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, we've got CETO now, which is the South East Asia Treaty Organization. So, in order to prevent South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia from falling to communism, Dulles, yeah, Dulles, (laughs) is going to put together a pact called CETO, and again, we're agreeing to defend each other. So it's the U.S., Great Britain, France, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Thailand, and Pakistan. Those are our CETO allies in, well, Asia and in the Pacific. So while this is going on, um, Soviets got a new leader, which is Khrushchev. And Khrushchev isn't as, like, hardcore as Stalin, but (laughs) um, he is trying to advocate peaceful coexistence. But while he's trying to advocate this, there's several things that happen that kind of uh, get the Soviets' distrust in the U.S. even more. So that by the time 1956 comes around, <laughs> he's going to basically say, we will bury you. <sighs> Let's go ahead and figure out what causes the distrust here. So, here we go. <laughs> Um, remember how I said, like, Turkey and Greece, you know, benefited from the Truman Doctrine, where they were trying to fight off communist control of their country. Truman's like, here, have a bunch of money and weapons, fight the communists. They're grateful, they're now our allies, and they stopped the spread of communism. They contained it. We don't do the same thing with Hungary. Hungary's asking for the same thing. In 1956, they're like, hey, United States, help us. Help us against the Soviets who are trying to take over. They want, the new liberal leaders of Hungary want Hungary to pull out of the Warsaw Pact. And so that's why they try to appeal to the United States. As well, Poland tries to appeal appeal to the United States as well. But um, Eisenhower is going to fear sending troops and aid to places like Hungary because they think it's going to, he thinks it's going to touch off another major war in Europe. So what we do is do nothing. We do the exact opposite of what we did for Greece and Turkey. We no Truman doctrine for Hungary at all. And, you know, the U.S. is doing nothing to help either the anti-communist revolts in these areas, uh, despite Dulles, like, pushing for the liberation policy. So by letting the Soviets take control of Hungary and Poland, we're basically acknowledging that, well, hope is lost in Eastern Europe. We, we can't fight off the communist influence. So we shift our focus to something else that we can develop, that we can try to fight the communists with, which is the space race. <laughs> okay, so uh, in 1957, we have ICBMs, which are intercontinental ballistic missiles. These are long-range missiles, and um, basically nuclear bombs can now travel long-range. So really, there's nowhere on Earth that's safe from nuclear destruction. You know, the Soviets were the first successful ones to launch an ICBM, and then came us, so we're falling behind. We fall even further behind with Sputnik. This is the first satellite launched into space. It's not launched by us, it's launched by the Soviets. 
So on October 1st, 4th, 1957, the space race pretty much gets kicked off with the launching of Sputnik. It's our first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. And now we're like, holy crap, <laughs> the Soviets got something in space and it didn't blow up. Uh, we're really fearing that um, we are going to be shot from space now. <laughs> so uh, Americans are shocked that the Soviets were able to do this. We thought we were like the most superior country ever. And yeah, the Soviets beat us in the space race for now. So there are fears of nuclear war intensified or being intensified with stuff like Sputnik. So since missiles that launch the satellites could also deliver <laughs> thermonuclear warheads <laughs> anywhere in the world in minutes and we have no defense against them. So this is why Sputnik paranoids us like there's no tomorrow. Because every time we try to launch a rocket and stuff, it usually explodes on us. And we're not very successful early on. We, explosions after explosions. I mean, we look like a fool. <laughs> so that's why we're going to push for better education, especially math and science education. It's going to kill two birds with one stone. Not only are we addressing the shortcomings of education, felt now at the hands of, well, trying to accommodate the boomers, because there's a whole bunch of them entering school. But I mean... You know, we're going to need to, like, definitely build up schools and promote this education that we need in order to try to, like, beat the Soviets, right? So, um, school districts are going to need a large cash infusion. We need to keep up with enrollment. Eisenhower does a little to help schools until 1958 with the National Defense of Education, Education Act. College enrollment increases at this time. And um, here's what the National Defense Education Act does. We're going to give money to local school districts to improve education. And because Sputnik like, lit the fire under our butts about this, we need more focus on math and science. So basically STEM and foreign languages because we'll hello spies. <laughs> so um, we improve education in other areas as well because, I mean, come on, we need to know geography. We need ESL, counseling guidance, school libraries, educational media centers. So, I mean, it does improve other things, but the main focus is math and science. It's also going to provide uh, higher education institutions with more money for low interest loans for students. And, um, yeah, it's going to foster this change in elementary and secondary education. So really, this kickstarts everything with education, with STEM, with math and science, and there we go. So um, let's go ahead and talk briefly about the U2 incident. So this is one of the things that gets um, Khrushchev kind of paranoid about us and basically shifting his tone of like peaceful coexistence and stuff to we will break you. <laughs> Uh, it's the U-2 incident. So in 1958, Soviet Union um, gives basically Western Europe six months to pull its troops out of West Berlin before turning over the city to East Germans. U.S. refuses to give in with that. And after there's a big confrontation about it, both nations agree to hold a summit in Paris in 1960 and have like some peace talks and stuff. So despite the Soviet Union refusing the Open Skies proposal from the Geneva summit because, yeah, we're like, hey, let us uh, fly some spies planes over your territory. <laughs> we thought that was a great idea. And Soviet Union's like, no, you will not do that. So that's what we're talking about with the Geneva summit with the Open Skies proposal. So after the Soviets tell us no, <laughs> uh, or rather right before the Soviets tell us no, actually... Oh, wait, no, 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 no. They already told us no. This is before the summit's supposed to happen in 1960. <laughs> Two weeks before that's supposed to happen. This guy, <laughs> Gary Powers, well, Francis Gary Powers, is flying a spy plane that we're not supposed to be flying over Soviet skies. He flies it over Soviet skies because, well, he was obviously told to do that. And he's captured and put on trial. <laughs> 
So the summer is now canceled. Eisenhower kind of looks a fool, blames himself for failing to ease Cold War tensions because this dude had to get caught. <laughs> so he's jailed in Russia until we could successfully exchange one of their spies for this guy in 62. And then Cuba. Cuba has their revolt um, happen in 1959. And Fidel Castro uh, comes in charge. And he is communist. He becomes communist dictator of Cuba. A lot of Cubans are going to flee to the United States, mainly to, you know, Florida, because it's close. So Castro is going to align himself with Khrushchev. And now we've got Soviet influence literally in our backyard because you could see how close Cuba is to Florida, okay? So that paranoids us to no end, <laughs> all right? And, um, you know, Castro nationalized all the U.S.-owned businesses and properties in Cuba. Eisenhower cuts off trade with Cuba. Castro, you know, of course, aligns with the Soviets, <laughs> And they have a trade agreement going on, so, over sugar. Soviets are going to supply Cuba with crude oil and petroleum products, as well as wheat, iron, fertilizers, and machinery. So this is a good exchange between Cuba and the Soviet Union, but of course we're paranoid because now the Soviet Union has an ally very close to us. They also provide them with money. So a communism only 90 miles off of our shores Eisenhower wants to try to execute a plan to overthrow Castro <laughs> with Cuban exiles living in the United States. So to be continued, guys, with the Bay of Pigs, we'll go ahead and um, talk about that <laughs> under Kennedy. So as far as Eisenhower's legacy, um, we've got atmospheric nuclear bomb testing to such a high degree that it was basically poisoning us. Radiation in the atmosphere was showing up in our food products in milk. <laughs> we were exploding so many nukes in the air, it was harmful to the point where we're gonna like pause <laughs> um, and basically, yeah, suspend atmospheric testing in 1958 temporarily. So Eisenhower, at the end of his presidency, is gonna speak out against the negative impact of the Cold War on society. He warns us against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. Basically, industry that caters to war. He's going to try to warn us about that. So, yeah, guys, this is the end of Eisenhower's presidency. Dude, um, in class, like I said, I'm going to show you guys duck and cover and probably another video over how many nuclear weapons we've exploded over time. It's going to blow your minds. <laughs> Bad pun right there, but... Uh, yeah, you'll see what I mean. But all right, guys, I will talk to you later. Bye.